When somebody mentions precious gems, the mind will inevitably wander to the sapphire. And for good reason, a gemstone with a very storied significance that has adorned nobility and clergy alike for centuries. It is objectively the very best birthstone, but I am also incredibly biased. What is a sapphire? What is its historical and religious significance? Does it come in more colors than just blue? And what industrial applications does it have? We'll discuss these questions and more in this, the 10th episode in the History of Birthstone series. But first, a word from the very best, like sapphires, sponsor to Evergrace, this channel, me. One of the core tenets of my channel that I'm trying to solidify is to bring you the very best value that I can. But that translates into my business as well, and at the end of the day, they're basically the same thing. This year I started a Mineral of the Month Club, and as it grows, I plan on adding more and more value. My dream with this is to help people create fun starter collections out of unique, fun gems, minerals, and fossils. Some months will be more interesting than others, but if you like shiny baubles, learning about the world we live in, or just want a unique gift for that magpie-brained loved one in your life, this is the subscription service for you. $10 USD a month plus shipping. This is one of the things that allows me to keep giving you all of the fun content that I can. So your support is greatly appreciated. Let's get back to the show. If you haven't yet, please consider leaving a like and a comment on this video because it really does help me in ye old algorithm. But let's begin. What is a sapphire? Sapphires are like rubies, a crystalline form of aluminum oxide. Unlike the ruby, however, which gets its color from trivalent chromium inclusions, when titanium and iron are present, a corundum will be blue. Corundum, again, being the parent type of rubies and sapphires. Other trace elements cause different colors. Corundums are delineated into two main groups, red equaling ruby and sapphire being, well, everything else by today's standards. Typically, though, if somebody asks for a sapphire, blue will come to mind. After all, the Greek word sapphiros, where we get the word sapphire from, literally means blue stone. Though modern historians believe that the ancient Hellenistic world was referring to lapis in many cases instead of sapphire, though, there is still some debate. Keep in mind, from a gemology perspective, a sapphire needs to be gem quality, translucent, and vibrant, to truly be a sapphire, just like rubies. However, mineralogically, it commonly just comes down to color. TLDR, sapphires come in a lot of colors, and maybe someday green corundums will get their own cool name. That said, the pink ones are called padparachas. I'm probably butchering that, but it does sound pretty cool, and I will admit that. So regardless of my own thoughts on what the other color should be called, that's how it is at this time. However, in folklore, history, art, and consumer awareness, Sapphires have always been associated with the color blue. Sapphires, being corundum, are hard, really hard, a 9 on the most scale of hardness putting them just under the diamond. Sapphires, like rubies, also form in various igneous and metamorphic deposits. Check out that video, it'll explain it a little bit more. This amazing gemstone has been seen in history since about 800 BCE, but the first major deposits to be consistently mined were from modern-day Sri Lanka, circa around 480 BCE. To this day, many high-grade sapphires still come from these deposits, and they are still highly desired. Now, nobility and clergy have desired them, yes, but let's look at the overall lore behind the sapphire. While the Greek word sapphiros may have actually been referring to lapis from time to time, we do know that the ancient Greeks and Romans believed that the sapphire would protect the wearer from envy and harm, and that they also represented truth, faithfulness, and sincerity. The Greeks specifically would dedicate the stone to Apollo, one of their gods, to curry his favor. Similarly, the peoples of Sri Lanka believed the sapphire would remove greed and dishonesty from a person. All three societies believed it would result in heavenly blessings. Interestingly, in the Middle Ages, clergy wore sapphires to symbolize heaven and the gems were believed to bring heavenly blessings. Bishops and other clergy would often, like with Amethyst in the 1400s, watch that video too, wore rings with sapphires for the reported blessings they reportedly derived. Again, interestingly, beliefs have a tendency to travel rather far through history. 
Sapphires were also associated with various nobilities in the Middle Ages, and that belief became ever more cemented in the modern age with the marriage of Charles III to Diana the Princess of Wales in 1981. Princess Diana's sapphire wedding ring all but cemented the sapphire as the gem of royalty in the modern age. In the Middle Ages, however, kings would wear sapphires in an attempt to protect themselves from their enemies. There is another interesting superstition that states a sapphire is tremendously bad for, for the luck if it's not suited for the person. Unlike the similar superstition concerning opals, which really is a doozy, this superstition is ground in a system we've already discussed. There is an interesting connection between the concept of birthstones and ancient astrology practices. The Hindu version of astrology tied sapphires to what is essentially Saturn. So the bad luck myth is derived from this astrological practice. People would wear stones associated with their signs and patron deities. It's like your boyfriend seeing you in your ex's hoodie, I guess. Remember, the first episode in this series, the concept of tying stones to celestial bodies had been practiced by other civilizations as well. Those transmigrated beliefs. The modern version of these is basically a condensed version of them all, and I'll use a quote from a Crystal Healing website to emphasize this quote. The magnificent and holy sapphire, in all its celestial hues, is a stone of royalty, of prophecy, and divine favor. End quote. Regardless of the beliefs surrounding it, sapphires are still one of the most highly prized gems in the world. Just look at them. But sapphires are more than just a pretty face they have some rather fascinating industrial applications as well. With a method to synthesize sapphire being created by French chemist August Vernuil, V-E-R-N-U-E-I-L. Don't ask me to pronounce it again, that's a rough one. In 1881, that was a long time ago, sapphires found a use in various industrial applications. Lab-produced sapphire is used as observation windows and testing equipment in space vehicles, it has applications in electronics, semiconductors, watches, and so much more. Have you had an endoscope checking you out before? Chances are the lens was a lab-grown sapphire. Now before we conclude, let's talk about a rather curious form of sapphire that is typically lab-grown. Very rarely, a sapphire, naturally, may have a rather muted color-changing ability much like alexandrite. However, this has been replicated in a lab, and color-changing sapphires are more commonly a, quote, thing now, typically called alexandrite sapphires. Natural sapphires are found in alluvial deposits and deep mining all over the world, but are prevalent in Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Thailand, Afghanistan, the United States, Australia, Tanzania, Kenya, Madagascar, and more. The Madagascar sapphires have really become popular in the last several years. If you live in the United States, however, there are pay-to-dig rock-hounding localities for this gem in both North Carolina and Montana. In my not-so-humble opinion, as a September baby, sapphires are the very best gem. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers!